Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be able to join uh, this meeting. Um, during my time at NIH, we particularly worked on rare forms of diabetes characterized by severe insulin resistance. So I actually have spent quite a bit of my career studying these patients, both taking care of them and trying to understand the causes. So although I haven't been primarily involved with rare diseases in recent years, actually uh, the majority of my career I, 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 I was very involved with this. Um, now, BMS doesn't really have a formal rare disease strategy, so in a way it's kind of a pleasure to be able to discover that just in the process of doing what we do, we've had the opportunity to contribute to trying to develop treatments for um, rare diseases. It kind of reminds me of a quote I love from John Lennon. Um, where he's supposed to have said, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. So even without having a rare disease strategy, it turned out that we were doing some work in rare diseases. What we do have as an R&D strategy is a desire to focus on patients who have high unmet medical need. Obviously, to be effective in R&D, one needs to also focus on diseases where scientific innovation and the progress of scientific understanding is such that you have a, enough understanding to try to develop new treatments. And so we've really tried at BMS, much like other companies, to focus on the overlap between these two circles. Patients with high unmet medical need where we have enough understanding of the science to do effective research and development uh, to develop new treatments. As you know, many orphan diseases are characterized by a high degree of high unmet medical need, and there's been you know, considerable advances in scientific understanding over the recent years, both in terms of understanding the disease pathogenesis and pathophysiology, so that it is possible to conduct productive R&D to design innovative therapies for many rare diseases. Um, one area where we have experienced some challenges is in the commercial space. And depending upon the disease prevalence, there may be challenges to identify optimal business models to develop and commercialize novel therapeutics. And obviously, these challenges are well known to this audience. Um, and you'll see that in some cases, we have uh, taken um, somewhat outside the box approaches. The three case studies that I'd like to tell you about are first a drug lomidopide to treat patients with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. And this, as you'll see, is an example where we took an innovative approach. And, and this drug is now actually being marketed by Agerion, having been um, approved by the FDA towards the end of last year. And although the drug was actually discovered as BMS, as you'll see, we, we have no interest whatsoever financially in the drug at this point. Um, metroleptin is a, is a compound, a protein, a, a, pro, a therapeutic protein that uh, has been developed um, to treat lipodystrophy syndromes. And it, the BLA has been submitted and is being reviewed by the FDA, and I won't be able to talk about the details of that, but that's the status. And as you'll see, also has been used to treat patients who have obesity due to mutations in the leptin gene. And, and that wasn't part of a formal development program, but is being uh, uh, given to patients under a compassionate need approach. Um, we, we acquired the metroleptin program kind of as a, as a side effect, in a way, of having bought um, Amelin Pharmaceuticals, and, and th th this was part of their pipeline. And more intentionally, we have recently uh, uh, introduced an LPA1 antagonist program into our pipeline as a result of acquiring Amira Pharmaceuticals. And, um, 
This is being studied as a potential treatment for another orphan disease, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So I'd like to tell you briefly <coughs> the lomidopide story, because and lomidopide is an inhibitor of microsomal transfer protein. Um, this, I think, kind of exemplifies um, a somewhat complicated uh, pathway to getting a drug approved, and uh, I think illustrates some principles um, of, of re really, I, I don't, of opportunism in a way, uh, an opportunistic approach to developing it. So it began with work, pioneering scientific work done by <coughs> some uh, former colleagues at BMS, John Wetterau, Dick Gregg, who are no longer with BMS, but they were there actually when I first joined a decade ago. And they had done some really innovative science that had its genesis in, of work John Wetterow did when he was a postdoc at Cornell. They cloned the microsomal transfer protein, which is a protein that's required for the sy synthesis and secretion of lipoprotein particles in the liver. Um, and they actually identified MTP as the disease gene for another genetic orphan disease, A-beta lipoproteinemia, and this work was done in the 1990s, so um, really uh, almost 20 years ago. And furthermore, they um, d discovered a, a compound, an MTP inhibitor, which could be shown to be effective in a rabbit animal model for familial hypercholesterolemia, the so-called Watanabe heritable hyperlipidemic uh, rabbit. Um, so that really suggested that the drug would be effective in homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. But we initially focused on a more, um, on a more common disease, more, the more common form of dyslipidemia. And you'll see that um, in this slide, um, and I must say, I can't read it very well from here, um, but hopefully I remember what happened. Um, so the, the drug discovery was done in BMS in the, in the pink panel uh, in the mid-1990s, and then a study was done in patients with the common forms of um, hy hyperlipidemia. And th this slide happens to be taken from Ajirian's presentation at the advisory committee and is available on the... Um, FDA website, so you don't need to actually photograph it. You'll get a better version of it if you go to the FDA website. Um, but uh, we did this clinical trial, showed that it in fact did improve the lipid profiles dramatically in patients with um, the common forms of dyslipidemia. However, there were some safety and tolerability observations related to fat accumulating in the liver when it couldn't be exported um, and put into lipoprotein particles, and also in the intestines. So it was believed that for patients with the relatively modest unmet medical need in the common forms of dyslipidemia, um, um, you, you, th that the benefit risk wouldn't be favorable. Um, however, a scientist at University of Pennsylvania, Dan Rader, um, felt that it might be beneficial in patients with the extremely high unmet need in the rare disease of homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia where these patients don't have effective treatment. So BMS actually made a philanthropic donation of the compound to University of Pennsylvania. So that was given to them, no strings attached. And um, eventually, studies were done both at University of Pennsylvania, and eventually, uh, Egerion acquired the compound to make it available to patients. And you'll see that in 2007, they initiated the registrational study, and the uh, drug was actually submitted to the FDA more recently and approved last year. So that's really... Um, something on the order of five years from the beginning of the registrational study to when the drug was approved. Um, this is an example of a patient, a 28-year-old woman, and you can see that this woman had very high LDL cholesterol of 780 milligrams per deciliter. For those of you not familiar looking at these numbers, 
Um, the target is probably to get it below 100 milligrams per deciliter for health. So this is dramatically elevated LDL. And you can see that with this high LDL cholesterol, actually it accumulates under the skin in these cutaneous xanthomas, and the patients develop uh, coronary artery disease at a very young age of 12. So this is a very severe disease with high unmet need, and many of the treatments don't work especially well for reasons that are more or less understood, but um, I won't go into at the moment. But again, these patients have extremely high unmet medical need and typically develop cardiovascular disease before the age of 20, suffering such things as coronary artery disease, myocardial infarction, heart failure, stroke, and sudden death. So you can see that there was need for a new drug. And these data are taken again from Egerion's pr presentation at the FDA advisory committee last year. And you can see that in patients who are already getting the standard of care, LDL cholesterol could be lowered by about 40%. And so this is really very meaningful uh, to these patients. And uh, this is a relatively modest study with 29 patients being studied again one of the typical features of a relatively rare, or in fact, a very rare um, or orphan disease um, that it's not feasible to study large numbers of patients, and the FDA is very um, reasonable and accepts what's possible as the basis of approval, and they did approve this um, drug. Um, so now I'd like to turn my attention to something that is actively being developed within the BMS pipeline, and I should say that we acquired um, Amelin Pharmaceuticals in collaboration with AstraZeneca so that this is actually being jointly um, developed by the two companies. Again, a somewhat innovative um, approach to, to um, R&D. <clears throat> now, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the history of this because, <clears throat> again, I think it illustrates the kind of indirect route that was taken from the original discovery to having a drug to treat lipodystrophy. And <clears throat> for me, this is kind of an instructive story. So initially, um, Jeff Friedman at Rockefeller University um, identified the leptin gene by positional cloning. He had been studying a mouse model of obesity and diabetes, which has a mutation that leads to loss of function of leptin. Uh, uh, and leptin was actually not even known before he did this positional cloning. And so it led to the, discussion, to the discovery of a new hormone or adipokine secreted by adipose tissue. And this, the, as I say, the OBOB mouse had homozygous loss of function mutations in the leptin gene and this led to a loss of feedback from the adipose tissue to the brain. And so the brain was, not, it's a way in a, that, that the adipose tissue has of telling the brain that the, the, the body has enough food and the nutritional status is good. So absent that feedback, the brain thought the body was starving and it caused uh, a lot of eating, um, both increased appetite and food intake, and which eventually led to massive increase in body weight, and there's some other associated phenotypic features that I won't go into for reasons of time. This shows how leptin works very effectively in a person, uh, uh, this child who has ex the same kind of mutation, homozygous loss of function mutations in leptin, <coughs> and work from Steve O'Reilly's lab in the UK, you can see on the left a three-year-old child who is really quite obese um, before leptin. And three years later, he's actually lost weight despite growing over three years. And, and on, the, on the right, you see a child who really looks relatively normal in terms of body weight. So it's really dramatic, life-changing efficacy when you replace this hormone that is lacking. Um, and so that proves that this works in people. Um, and back when I was at NIH, um, we were studying patients uh, who um, 
um, had various genetic forms and other forms of extreme insulin resistance and diabetes, and we happen to have had an interest in lipodystrophy. And this is an example of one patient um, whom we first saw at the age of 15 when she was really severely affected. Uh, she had very high triglyceride levels, around 10,000. Um, and you may know 150 is where you'd like it to be. So 10,000 is really very high. And this led to all kinds of medical problems, including a huge liver and other things. And she frankly couldn't get out of bed when we first saw her. Um, and this happens not to be a genetic form, but this is an acquired form of generalized lipodystrophy. This is an MRI which shows that she has a huge liver which is full of fat and, and in addition, patients with this very high triglyceride often get pancreatitis as a result of that. Um, and th th we had been studying at, at NIH and NIDDK four groups of patients. First of all, patients with generalized lipodystrophy where they have a near total absence of fat, both under the skin and in the viscera. And you know the famous quote, you can't be too rich or too thin? Well, it turns out you can be too thin. And the body needs to be able to store triglycerides in, you know, in adipose tissue where it's metabolically appropriate. And if there's no adipose tissue in which to store the triglycerides, it ends up in other tissues causing severe problems such as insulin resistance, diabetes, and other th problems such as liver disease, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, et cetera. Um, and there are two forms of generalized lipodystrophy, both a genetic form, which is typically congenital, and an acquired form, often associated with autoimmune disease, which may be resulting from autoimmune destruction of fat cells, although that hasn't been rigorously proven. And um, you, you can see that these patients have very high triglyceride levels and low leptin levels. Um, and this actually led my postdoctoral fellow at the time, Ella Foral, to hypothesize that if we gave leptin to these patients we, and replaced the leptin deficiency, we would help them. And fortunately, Brown and Goldstein's lab at around the same time published a paper showing in a mouse model of lipodystrophy or lipoatrophy um, leptin was very beneficial to the mice, and we eventually were able to do a clinical study. And we also studied patients with a milder form of so-called partial lipodystrophy, where they are lacking fat in part of the body, but not all. And there are, again, various forms of this, both congenital or genetic and uh, acquired. And uh, it tends to be milder because there's not a total absence of fat. And this shows an example of that patient whose photograph I showed you, um, who was studied as part of a collaboration between um, the University of Texas Southwestern and NIDDK. And Amgen at the time provided the metroleptin because they had taken a license from the Rockefeller that enabled them to study metroleptin, which is just leptin with a methionine at the end terminus, um, uh, to study it. And they studied it in the common form of obesity, where it had variable efficacy and not dramatic efficacy overall, so that um, they eventually didn't really want to pursue the um, obesity indication. It was at that time that they were willing to allow us to initiate the um, studies in metroleptin. Now, I left uh, NIH, so wasn't really involved for most of the time this study was going on, but this study started in 2002, and so it's been going on for over a decade, and that first patient whose photograph I showed you was not only the first patient to receive it, but has continued to receive it over the past decade, uh, first through the courtesy of Amgen, and then Amgen sold the program to Amelin, and Amelin continued to support the program while they ex further explored obesity. When the dust settled, the obesity indication probably isn't going to work out, and we ended up with the thing that will perhaps eventually make it an approved drug, and indeed, I believe Shionogi has gotten the drug approved in Japan. Um, has been this study that was really not envisioned as a registrational study when NIDDK first did it. Now you can see that the liver shrank dramatically because of a decrease in fat, 
and also the lipid levels, which had previously been approaching 10,000. We had her on weekly plasmapheresis to remove the triglycerides, which got it down somewhat, but eventually with metroleptin, we could get it to a near normal level without even needing to do the uh, plasmapheresis. This work is published in the New England Journal of Medicine a number of years back, and I'm only sharing with you a completely public domain information. I'm not giving you any of the confidential um, information. Um, so the final uh, uh, program I'd like to tell you about, again, I think has an interesting mix of academic inputs, biotech inputs, and eventually large pharma. Um, so uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, as you may know, is a very, very severe progressive pulmonary disease, which has five-year survival rates similar to metastatic cancer. So it's really a, a terrible disease. Um, and it has a prevalence in the U.S. on the order of 50,000. So it has been identified by the FDA as an orphan disease. And indeed, our compound has orphan drug uh, de designation from the FDA. So it began by work at Mass General Hospital by Andy Tager and collaborators. And uh, what they eventually were able to show was that in an animal model of pulmonary fibrosis where, patient, where the patients, the, the mice are given bleomycin into their trachea, which causes pulmonary damage and eventually scarring and fibrosis, they showed that the, in the, as, as a lead-in, there was a chemical substance in the bronchoalveolar lavage fluid that attracted fibroblasts, and they identified that as lysophosphatidic acid, and eventually showed that in addition, uh, it was the LPA1 receptor of one member of a family of LPA receptors that was responsible for mediating the adverse effects of LPA to promote fibrosis and scarring. And in addition, they confirmed that LPA levels were elevated in the bronchoalveolar lavage of patients with IPF. And eventually, they showed efficacy in various animal models of fibrotic disease, including the bleomycin-induced pulmonary fibrosis. And we eventually, based on all of this information, acquired the compound by virtue of acquiring the company. And again, you'll see first work at Mass General, the drug discovery done at uh, a biotech, and, and now the late stage development being done by a large pharma. So in summary, I guess the message I'd just like to leave is, uh, to paraphrase uh, our former Secretary of State, it takes a village to develop a drug. And in each of these vignettes, the work began with pioneering research into mechanisms of disease, generally at academia, although, interestingly, the work on A-beta lipoproteinemia and MTP was done by scientists at BMS rather than academia. Um, the drug discovery in this case was done at BMS. Initially, we were focused on the common form of dyslipidemia, but eventually it was repositioned for homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. And in a somewhat atypical way, the final development, late stage development and commercialization was done by a biotech, uh, Agirion. With metroleptin, the pioneering work was done at the Rockefeller University to identify leptin. Amgen took leptin and made it into metroleptin to make it easier to produce. Um, Amgen tried it in obesity, as did amylin, and the drug migrated from Amgen to amylin, and the NIDDK and University of Texas Southwestern ended up doing what was never envisioned as the registrational study, but in retrospect may turn out to have been the registrational study. But the final um, work, uh, to get it made available to patients will come from, if, assuming it's approved, will come from BMS and AstraZeneca. And finally, with the LPA1 antagonist, the academic work happens to have been done by investigators at Mass General. Amira Pharmaceuticals recognized this, did the drug discovery, and we've ended up uh, owning the program, and we're taking it in initially 
as an orphan disease drug for uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So I thank you very much for your attention and would welcome any comments or questions.